NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. The people, there are people in this room who really made Clemency Project 2014 happen. Uh, Norman Reamer, uh, for one, who said NAFTA will stand up. Mary Price, who just left. Um, uh, Marjorie Pierce, who's back there. Marjorie Love, Nikichi Taifa. I mean, there's so many people who worked on that project. Um, that was some of the best work I can say that I've ever done after standing up in a courtroom for almost 20 years, seeing people go in, it was just a delight to think that people had the opportunity to come out. Uh, yeah. What that did was, though, highlight collateral consequences, right? See that segue? Still good at it. Um, it highlighted collateral consequences and uh, the impact that it had on folks coming out of prison. And we've got some experts here on our panel who are going to talk about them. I hope you have your copy of uh, the collateral consequences work that NACDL has done uh, with Rick Jones and Vicki Young spearheading the committee for that report that uh, included Margie Love, that's it, where they identified all of these collateral consequences. So. You know, we had a conference call and we said, what do we talk about and with collateral consequences? What does Angela want? What should, should we say? And we thought, thought about first starting with, what are they? Uh, and that sounds like a weird or, or unconventional topic for criminal defense lawyers, but I can tell you uh, that clemency taught me and showed me there are tons of them uh, that, with which I was not familiar. I ran across one. There's a fishing license in California that you cannot get, right? And so they're just everywhere, everywhere. And we have to work to remove that scarlet letter. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what they are, because um, you won't know all of them, and we don't know all of them, because a lot of them are hidden. And then we'll talk a little bit about how they've impacted not just people who've been in the system, but folks who surround the system. We know that families are affected by this. We know communities are affected by this, and frankly, we know that our country is affected by this. We have people who you know, can't vote, can't participate in contributing to the tax base, uh, can't live their lives. Uh, and then lastly, we're gonna look at what are some of the solutions uh, that are surmountable, right? Right now and maybe long term. Um, so what we agreed to do, kind of with my pushing, was not to do formal introductions because um, what we'll do is I'll throw a question to the panelists and I'll ask the panelists to give you something from their heart that they want you to know about them. You can read the credentials in the program, uh, but we want you to hear from their hearts. Then we're gonna have a conversation around these issues but saving the best for last, we're gonna keep this open for Q&A. So get your brains in gear after that coffee that you just had, and uh, let's, let's have a conversation about these collateral consequences. I know um, you're frustrated by them, uh, but together we can surmount them. Um, so we have uh, Jason Hernandez here who who I like to say has the commitment uh, that, he, he said I could say this, that a pig has to breakfast, right? The bacon. Um, and then we have Margie Love, who's the big brain uh, on the panel. Not that the other brains aren't big, but she's the, the big, big brain, the academic on the panel. Uh, and then we have John, who also has the commitment of, of the pig uh, in this process. So uh, Jason, I'm gonna start with you. And just, uh, you know, knowing the path that you've trod, um, we know that there are collateral consequences when we think about what they are um, that are in the statutes and that are in the regulations. But you've lived this. You've lived the consequences. Uh, tell us a little bit about you, first of all, 
and then tell us about that lived experience with collateral consequences. Well, it's just uh, truly an honor to be here right now. I feel like I'm here not only on my behalf, but a lot of people that are uh, formerly incar that are still incarcerated right now, people that I know and people that I uh, uh, that I know that are amazing individuals uh, that are still incarcerated in there. And the thing about me is I, I'm from Texas. Uh, probably can tell a little bit from my accent. <laughs> uh, in 1998, at the age of 21, I was sentenced to life without parole plus 320 years for a uh, nonviolent drug crime, uh, crack cocaine. And that was despite the judge telling me. And this was one of the most conservative judges uh, in the United States, which I think every judge in Texas is like the most conservative judge <laughs> in the United States from what, I, what I'm told and what I see. And even he had told me he didn't want to give me life without par uh, parole, but that his hands were tied and that uh, he had written Congress and tried to change the crack cocaine disparity, but that it just couldn't. There was just no type of uh, compromise at that time, no type of uh, uh, laws to, uh, law to do that. So at the age of 21, I ended up going to prison. And you know the thing about me, I mean, they were talking about here earlier about what were your dreams and what were your goals uh, to some of the individuals that were on the panel earlier. And you know, when I was five or six, my dreams, my goals were like any other kids. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to win the Super Bowl, right? And at the age of around 13, 14, my dreams and goals changed drastically. I wanted, I, 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 and I'm ashamed to admit this, I mean, I wanted to be uh, the godfather, right? I wanted to be Scarface. I watched those movies and uh, in my neighborhood, a neighborhood that nobody cared about, a neighborhood where, a, a very poor neighborhood, all of a sudden people are wearing gold chains, driving Cadillacs, uh, wearing suits. First time I ever seen somebody wear a suit, uh, it was a, a drug dealer. There was nobody in my neighborhood wearing suits or anything like that. Everybody that I know that wore a suit was a, was a white person. And people that my parents' houses they used to clean and landscape. So at a very young age, at the age of 15, I started selling marijuana. And unfortunately, uh, I was good at it. I'm ashamed, ashamed to admit. And the uh, federal government launched an investigation against me. And that ultimately led to me going to prison. You know, while I was there, I was, my brother was also incarcerated with me as well, my older brother. And in 2002, my brother was serving 30 year sentence for less than five grams of crack cocaine. It was his second drug offense. His first offense was marijuana, which he did two years for, for two ounces. And in 2002, I called home one day and my father, my, my father's old school, right? Doesn't show any type of emotion or anything uh, to that extent. And he answered the phone and he was crying, and he was crying like a baby. And I asked, why, why are you crying, Dad? What's going on? And he said, your brother, they killed him. They killed him. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about, Dad? He said, JJ, this morning, uh, he was stabbed to death by three other inmates. And, you know, it was, uh, it was you know, it, it, it took that for me to, to, to awaken, to tell myself that, you know what, I wasn't born. Mexicans weren't born to sell drugs, to use drugs, to go to prison. There's nothing normal with that. And I set out to try to uh, not only try to change and better myself, but to change and better uh, other prisoners around me. Just didn't know how. And I became, I started studying my own, uh, st doing my own case. I read every fed second, fed third, fed supplement, fed sub second book that you could possibly read. Unfortunately, I started reading books that were that started in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, from the fit, and the, the Fifth Circuit was very liberal at that time. Judge, uh, Judge Wisdom, Tuttle, Revis. Uh, you, you would read these these uh, these decisions, and they were like poetry, right? But then when I got a little bit more to Fed 155 and started reading cases in the 1990s, it was like a nightmare, right? Harmless error, and. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's how I educated him. I became what was known as a jailhouse attorney in there. I filed everything that you could possibly think of. Uh, writ of certiorari's, 2255's, 3582C2's, Rule 60B's, uh, everything that you could possibly think of, I filed it and it was all rubber stamped. Uh, but it, it kind of prepared me. And little did I know, it started to prepare me. And then the next thing you know, 2008, President uh, Barack Obama uh, is elected. 
And with that, I read his book called The Audacity of Hope, and it gave me hope. And I said that if there's anybody that kind of understand, that will understand that, that there were not bad kids, right, growing up. We're just kids who make bad decisions sometimes, and we shouldn't die in prison for them. But then in 2010, I read, I read another book called The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And that book, what that book did to me, uh, you know, first it, it, it let me know that there was a system created and designed to uh, incarcerate and destroy uh, minorities, right? That the war on drugs was never a war on drugs, that in fact there was a war against minorities. And when I found this out, that I fell into this trap, that I got mad. But it, I got mad to the extent that I didn't want to fight with my fist, but I wanted to fight with my mind. And I started reaching out to organizations. This was in 2010. I, uh, I found a segment of, of a population of prisoners in there that I felt that deserved a second chance. I, I, deserved, I thought everybody did, but this one particular set of, uh, of, of prisoners, first time nonviolent crack cocaine offender serving life without parole, which I was, who had been incarcerated more than 10 years and who had an exemplary record while they were in there. And the reason I started that, and not only for myself, but for the whole general population was because I knew these guys. These were some of the greatest individuals I had ever met uh, in my life, right? President Barack Obama, he visited that prison when I left, and President Barack Obama said that he could have easily been one of those inmates, right, had he not lived in a more forgiven uh, environment, in a more forgiven society. And I have never met President Barack Obama, and I'm kind of mad at him for that. <laughs> but if I do, I'm going to tell him that there are some amazing individuals in there who, had they been in a, had they been in a more forgiven society, that they could have easily been lawyers, doctors, mentors, even president of the United States, and I say that with all the conviction in my heart. So what I did, I started my own organization called Crack Open the Door, and I wanted to put in a face to the statistic. Everybody knew the statistics, but they didn't know that these were somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's sister, somebody's brother. They didn't know about the person that was serving life without parole that taught me and taught thousands of other uh, prisoners how to weld. They didn't know about the prisoner in there that, was, that we call preacher. Who that when he had his sermons, two, three hundred people would, would attend them. He, people didn't know about these individuals that were, that were incarcerated. So I put my own petition together and I penned a letter to President Barack Obama. And I didn't know it at the time, but I would find out later that in 2000, 2011, uh, September 19th, when I sent it to him, that he actually got that letter. Because I didn't trust the pardon attorney's office at that time, <laughs> right? And for good measure. Uh, there was a lot going on at the pardon attorney's office at that time. So I sent my petition and a letter to them, and I said, you know what, I'm going to send this to President Barack Obama. And what I didn't know was that President Barack Obama at that time, if you were a prisoner and you sent a letter to the president, it automatically went to the Department of Justice. He changed that to where if a prisoner wrote and they felt that he should read that letter uh, to give it to him at the end of the day. Uh, mine was one of those letters. Nobody wanted to help me. I was, uh, were like Life Without Parole, I was a leader organizer. Uh, we ended up getting in contact with a person that we found on the internet named uh, Anthony Underwood and his father. Uh, they, they were at that time called C4 Justice and William Underwood, his father, advocating, they were seeking clemency for his father as well. Then we got in contact with Nikichi Taifa uh, as well, who I would say is, was doing clemency when clemency wasn't cool. Right. right. Nobody was talking about clemency back then. And they, usually, they never talk about it. It's like seasonal. And that's the problem, well, I believe, with clemency. But uh, 2013, I was granted, I was, uh, granted a, a second opportunity. President Barack Obama commuted my sentence from life without parole plus 300 years to 20 years. I ultimately served 17 and a half years. I was released 2015, August the 11th. I uh, just hit my third year anniversary. <laughs> But with that, I know I've probably been talking a little bit too much, and we can come back to me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but with that, uh, just, wow, just, just truly blessed uh, to be here right now, right? I would still be incarcerated, and I hope that uh, there's time that Cynthia can ask me some of the things that I've done since I've been out, uh, but I would still be incarcerated. Nearly 500 people, 500 people President Barack Obama let out that were serving life without parole. Many of them crack cocaine offenders, many of them minorities, right? And I understand Trump let out one person, uh, uh, 
African-American lady, Alice Marie Johnson, and I thank him for that, right? Probably the only thing. Uh, but we need to figure out how do we do this clemency on, on a mass level, just as the war on drugs was used to create mass incarceration, we should use mass clemency to release those people now. So, Marty, Jason highlights uh, a specifically poignant uh, piece in our criminal justice system. I always say that we have to admit that it's racist and broken, or we must continue to cling to the idea that there are criminal types, right? Because, I mean, that's the dichotomy. Uh, and we, we see that in our law in kind of almost a dog whistle kind of way with the war on drugs, with communities that are more significantly impacted by our laws. Um, as criminal defense lawyers, uh, what can we do, Margie? What can we do when we're dealing with these collateral consequences? What should we be thinking about for our clients? Um, and tell a little bit about yourself first, because I know you want first. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say, um, before I start, is this mic on? Is this thing on? Yes? <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, good. Um, you know, I'm really glad that Jason went first, because he kind of got us to a point um, of his coming home. And there was something that uh, one of the panelists, Teresa Hodge, said this morning that really stuck with me. I wrote it down. Um, and she said, when she came home, she said, no one prepared me. No one prepared me. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of struck by the, the, um, the title of the panel, um, the campaign against the scarlet letter. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the scarlet letter for which no one prepared Teresa Hodge and no one prepared many people who go to prison. And that kind of links into what can criminal defense lawyers do? What can judges do? Um, just to say a word about my own odyssey through um, Scarlet Letter land, um, I started working with collateral consequences 30 years ago, just about to the day. Um, and at the time, I was in the office of the Deputy Attorney General in the Justice Department, uh, at Den of Prosecutors. Um, and uh, it was in the middle of the war on crime, war on drugs, and there was a pretty hard attitude. And the, the system was conceived of as uh, prosecution, sentencing, and jail. There was no sense of a larger system where you thought about it in systemic terms, almost in circular fashion. Like, why do you come in? Who comes in? How can you stop people from coming in? Once you're in, how do you get out? Is there an end to this system? So when I was made pardon attorney by um, then De Deputy Attorney General Bill Barr, who later became Attorney General, um, I thought it was really, uh, I was being cast into outer darkness. Uh, I thought this was the worst thing that had ever happened, and I had to go out to Chevy Chase for, to my office. And the, the only concession I wrung from Bill was that we had to bring the office back downtown because I thought it was ridiculous if we were supposed to be working for the president to have an office in Chevy Chase. Um, and anyway, I lived downtown and didn't like to drive cars, so. Um, I served for almost 10 years as the pardon attorney, which meant that I was in charge of this office that you thought, actually, quite correctly, uh, was pretty dysfunctional. And um, I, I really became quite co-opted by the, uh, the mission of that office. Um, and the idea of um, somehow um, being able to bring an end to this experience in the criminal justice system, to be able to tell good news. I was thinking Governor Deal just said something that, that uh, he's one of his final comments about the importance of telling good news. And I always was frustrated by the degree of hostility that the prosecutors in the Justice Department um, demonstrated toward the pardon program 
because I thought, gosh, you know, isn't it part of the success of our program that people would actually become uh, better people and changed through this, through this process? And that if they came out of it, came out of prison, um, and basically became law-abiding, productive citizens, which was the phrase we always used to use, law-abiding and productive citizens. Wasn't that the kind of good news you ought to tell about the justice system, that it really works? And, and in the federal system, at least, um, the, the emblem of that working, that emblem of getting rid of the scarlet letter, um, is a presidential pardon, for better, for worse, for more than 200 years, that's the way it's been. Uh, that remains the only thing in the federal system that is a demonstration of forgiveness. Um, and, and, and I do want to talk l later, perhaps, about some of the things that are going on across the country, which are enormously exciting, um, to address this problem of the Scarlet Letter. But the, the Scarlet Letter, the literal a, that Hester Prine had to wear in the Nathaniel Hawthorne novel uh, of 200 years. His story was a 17th century story, wrote it in the middle of the 19th century. That red felt A for adulteress that Hester Prine had to wear on her dress um, is what people who have a criminal conviction wear inside and wear for the world to see through the unfortunate technological developments of the last 30 years that allow us to find out what people's records are without even leaving our desk. Um, that to me is um, the thing that in the coming years, as we realize, as Governor Deal told us, as we've heard so much wonderful panels today about how the prison experience uh, has got to be cut back. There's so many more people in prison than need to be. And I do believe that, that the, the prison population uh, and the people we send to prison, the, our decisions to send people to prison, will result in fewer and fewer people in prison, um, but we will remain with this downstream um, effect of the crime war, which is the millions of people who are um, uh, stuck with this scarlet letter of the criminal conviction that bars you from so many benefits and opportunities. Um, and if it's not literal laws, and rules, it's this informal discrimination, uh, which in a way is even more pernicious. Um, so how do we deal with that? I think that is the biggest challenge um, that we now have. Obviously, sentencing reform is tremendously important. But my work has been after the sentence has been served after the court-appointed sentence has been served, and people are still left with burdens that, as Teresa Hodge said, no one prepared her for. So, so that's our work, and there is actually a huge amount of good news going on, not so much in the federal system, I'm sad to say, because um, that's where I work mostly, um, but in the states. There is some very, very exciting stuff going on. So, but I want to stop there, and uh, we can come back to that. Thank you. Shortly. So I was uh, recently in the Republic of Georgia uh, teaching lawyers jury trial techniques. And it struck me that um, they are so hopeful uh, about the jury trial system and have this very different attitude about defendants after they serve their sentence. You know, it's, it, it's really wiped the slate clean and embrace them. And there was a folk story that I heard when I was there uh, that th there was a king who liked angels. And so he summoned the court artist to paint an angel for him. And the court artist went about the countryside looking for an angel 
And he came upon a woman with a baby. And he said, ah, I'll paint this baby as an angel. And he presents this portrait to the king, and the king accepts it. And after that king passed, the next king uh, liked devils. And so he summoned that same uh, court artist to paint a picture of a devil. And the man went out to find a devil. He found a homeless person, uh, an elderly man who was out on the street. And he said, I'm going to paint you as a devil for the king. And the man's response was, you may paint me as a devil, but you painted me as an angel when I was a baby. Right? And so it strikes me that our clients are angels but they do some devilish things. We're not just one story, John. And I think that says a lot about your life and about uh, the road that you've traveled. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and then how you encounter and now fight uh, the collateral consequences, especially around you know, probation and supervision and things like that? Sure, thank sure. you. And, and thank you, Angeline, for, for putting this together. Norman, really appreciate this and uh, for bringing these important issues to the forefront. Uh, my name is John Kufos. I'm the National Director of Reentry Initiatives uh, at Right on Crime. Uh, I'm based in DC, although the organization's based in Texas. Uh, my primary role is as executive director of a project called Safe Streets and Second Chances. Uh, which is a, a partnership with Florida State University, Right on Crime, uh, and Coke Industries. And the, I guess I'll tell you how I got here by starting, by like all trial attor attorneys, right, with a, with a story. Mm -hmm. So January 18th, 2012, I am standing before the New Jersey Supreme Court uh, in the Republic of New Jersey, or at least they think it is. Um, <laughs> I'm standing before the Jersey Supreme Court. I guess I'm 34 at the time. And I'm arguing at the time the largest search and seizure case uh, in the state. It's a case I had won at the trial level, the appellate level. Uh, I was, again, 34, relatively young man. And this was the cap on a career that was going really well. I was a certified criminal trial attorney. Uh, I had you know, won cases all over the state, all the trappings of success. Law uh, taught, taught at a college. And the only thing that I was thinking as I was standing there before the justices was that I was out on $150,000 bail. And very shortly I'd be pleading guilty uh, and then be off to prison. So I finished the case. Um, it was the last case I did. I would plead guilty uh, because my alcoholism caught up to me and worse yet caught up to another person. I was driving drunk uh, months before that and hit someone and then try to lie my way out of it. Thank the Lord I didn't kill them, but it was nothing I did to help that. Um, that person went on to you know, recover. Again, I did nothing to help that either. Um, my path would be to get clean and to go to prison, as, as I mentioned. Um, so I would do my time in the state system in New Jersey. And it was interesting because if you looked at my background, subtracting the anomaly that was a successful law career, uh, it made a lot of sense why I was there. Father, right, in and out of prison, was a federal fugitive, actually escaped from prison. So I was taken around the country, saw 39 states as a kid. Um, as I mentioned to somebody else before, when I had to fill out my bar application, I had 14 addresses, actually legit addresses. I'm like, how the hell am I gonna remember where I was, you know, in Kansas? Um, but in any event, mom, a teenage mom, and, you know, her own substance issues, and, uh, I had the blessing and the curse of being a completely functional alcoholic. So here I am sitting in prison and never knowing I'd work in reentry, never thinking I'd work in reentry, candidly trying to keep my head down because I was a very high profile inmate in a very little republic, right, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and I would watch guys go out to the halfway house and then he'd be sent right back within weeks because they either didn't have identification or they had like warrants bench warrants for unpaid fines and all this craziness. And I'm watching this happen over and over in my head. I'm like, this is the easiest thing in the world to fix, right? It would, it would like boggle the mind of anyone who's ever been in a courtroom. So I kind of filed that in the back of my head. I, uh, along the way, um, a very touching experience. You know, I had, I had no problems with any of my cellmates um, or really people in the prison. And you know, nobody asked me for money 
which again was a relief since I was going bankrupt anyway. But um, nobody asked me for money, but everybody asked me for a job. And I never forgot that, right? And I get out, house gets foreclosed upon. I'm from the Jersey Shore, which I promise you is much nicer than a TV show. Um, <laughs> although the people are kind of like that. But in any event, um, you know, so I move in with an old law school roommate uh, in Hoboken. And for any of you that know New Jersey, like Hoboken's a party town. It's not like, like Austin, Texas or wherever. It's not where a drunk goes to get sober, right? I mean, the, you know. <laughs> so in any event, uh, I'm released on parole after a year and a half. And uh, now I have to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. I was lucky, unlike 90% of the people I was with, is that I had a job waiting for me at a private company. Uh, not practicing law, obviously, but I, I did have a job. And I never forgot those people, and I couldn't do any pro bono work because I didn't have a law license any longer. All my pro bono work was for the NAACP in Central Jersey. So I read about Jim McGreevy, the former governor in New Jersey, doing a prison ministry program uh, in Jersey City. So I didn't know anyone political. Um, you know, back then, not as many politicians in New Jersey were getting locked up, so I, I could never make that part of my practice area. Um, apparently now it's a thing, right? I miss all the economic waves. Um, but, you know, it's, such is life, right? So, so in any event, I call up, uh, I call the mayor of Jersey City, again, who I don't know, and I say, hey, you know, here's my story, and, which was on the front page of all of our local papers. Um, I don't need reentry services but I have a whole bunch of old drinking buddies that'll clear up driver's licenses for you, right? So he connects me with Jim McGreevy. Jim and I start chatting, and for nine months, I volunteered for him. Uh, after that, he took me to see Governor Christie, and they said, uh, the administration said, build us a model of reentry, uh, post-incarceration. So I did that, but of course, I, I, I was like a savant, right? I knew law and nothing else. So I started there, and I realized that Although I couldn't practice law, I had a whole lot of friends who could. So what we were going to do is we were going to start by making sure everybody has identification, nobody has warrants, and everybody eligible gets a driver's license. Right? That was a threshold ticket to the dance, that we, that, the way we viewed it. So we forged a partnership through the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, which I was blessed to be the executive director of for three years, with the Motor Vehicle Commission, uh, my old buddies and then actually some some reputable lawyers as well you know and, and new young lawyers to clear up driver's licenses and i created what i called uh, a poor man's uber for lawyers i took uh the leap case management system i was lucky enough to know the ceo of leap and i made a centralized cloud-based filing system where lawyers would tap in around the state to take a client's file to clear up driver's licenses uh, that crazy idea uh, result in over 400 driver's licenses restored. Now, what we could do with that and why it's so relevant to this crowd is because what you can do with a driver's license means now your folks can get into the building trades, they can get better jobs, they can get CDLs and things of that nature. So we ended up putting cohorts of returning citizens into uh, into building trade training, right? So we have a cohort in the laborers, cohort in the carpenters, etc. Um, so when you, one of the collateral consequences that I saw that for our population, which, you know, isn't written down anywhere, the prison would tell me when I, let me go back. The, the motor vehicle commission told me that our clients should just go to the motor vehicle office to find out what's wrong with their license and then clear it up. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Until they've never been to court or, or an MVC, first of all. And I made a joke, which didn't go over well. I was like, look, these people already did like 20 years. They don't want to spend 17 waiting in line at the MVC, <laughs> right? And then like, I was the only guy laughing, but such is life, right? So anyway, so I tell them, I said, listen, nobody's going to the MVC because there's a cop at every one. So when they find that $85 ticket from the Point Pleasant Beach Municipal Court, they go to the jail from the MVC. And also without an identification, I said, we can send them to jail, at least give them the ID, right? But... Anyway, so I said, listen, you give me the sanctions reports. I'll get them into the case management system to the lawyers, and we'll clear up licenses. And they told me I was nuts. Maybe I am, but it worked. Um, and now we're duplicating that in the Safe Street Second Chances states we're working on. And that's something where 
so that, that collateral consequence of no one walking into the MVC, right? That's like a real consequence for our population because the DOC doesn't feel like clearing up the license before you leave, right? Or, or the best is they clear up the detainer to get you a new court date that you have no transportation to go to anyway, right? So anyway, so we fixed that problem. Um, and, and as a result of that, we were able to create employment opportunity where it didn't exist before. And I'm really inspired uh, you know, by my lawyer friends in New Jersey. Uh, you know, we're building similar analog models around the country. Um, I see my friend Casey Taylor in the room from Root and Rebound. They're doing some fantastic work in this space as well as so many other folks are. And this is the place where the criminal defense community can be the tip of the spear in reentry to fix these issues. Because if you don't, right, you're, you're, you're locking people out of health care. Well, I mean, whatever you need an ID for, actually. I have no point in listing them all. But think of everything you ever need an ID for, not to mention the cop who might remember you and says, hey, what are you doing? Can I see some ID? And you don't have any, right? So I've saved my prison ID, by the way, which is useless to me. And as I mentioned uh, in an earlier panel, I, when I lock myself in a room in the house, I can pop the lock with it if I happen to have it in that same room. And it has really no value. I use it as a coaster sometimes. And to be honest... It's, fan, it's fascinating, right, that a person will sit in prison for, a, for any kind of period of time. The DOC has a badge, so they can request anything they want from any agency, yet they simply don't do it, right? And so much of what we do, and then I'll shut up for a second, so much of what we do is getting our population back to zero. Think about that. Right? We have to get our population back to zero, whether it's in the education system, addiction treatment, healthcare, ID, work, etc. And whether our prisons should or shouldn't do it, whether our prisons are or aren't doing it, um, you know, I, I, I can tell you that I've done better work for the legal system as a disbarred felon than I ever did winning murder in other types of cases. So I encourage you to not follow my path and you know and lose your license and like ruin your life on the front page of the newspaper to do anything good, right? But encourage you to think about ways to align with community partners, places like Root and Rebound, other nonprofits who are doing this work, and your own pro bono networks. Because for once in my life, rather than you know judging my life by not guilty verdicts. I was able to judge my life by, again, rebuilding, uh, rebuilding people. So I'll stop for now. Thanks. So, so when I think about what criminal defense lawyers uh, deal with, right, trial and plea and sentencing where we exercise uh, advocacy on behalf of our client, and we think about um, letting the judge know because judges don't know the collateral consequences either, right? They, they have no clue. They have no clue in many ways. But this is one of the ways in which they have no clue. And, and sometimes we don't know. We don't know uh, the stories to tell around what folks who have been released will experience. And so, Jason, I know you have some very poignant experiences around your release that you can share with us so we can begin to think of the arguments that we need to make to the judge that say this too is part of the sentence that you're about to hand down. Uh, yeah, well, well, the unfortunate reality, and somebody mentioned it earlier on another panel, that when you're in a maximum security penitentiary, which I was for 10 years of, my, of my, the initial part of my prison sentence, when you have life without parole, you aren't allowed to basically take any type of reentry program or any type of rehabilitative program. Those are, and they'll sit there and tell you, you're not going home. You don't, you don't need this. Uh, this is, these, these programs are available for somebody that's about to get released. And when you're already, you know, when you're already serving life without parole and they tell you that, I mean, it, it, it brings you down, right? Like, well, I'm trying to do better and they're telling me, uh, you're not allowing me. But I did, I mean, when I was in there, when, oh, and when my brother passed, I lived every day like I was going home tomorrow because I, I had believed it, right? Just don't give up. Uh, that window will open. You have to be prepared for it when, when it does. 
And I was able to take welding. I was able to take culinary arts, uh, get my paralegal uh, certificate. And I was only able to get those because I had to, I had to pay the, the prisoners that worked with the professors that were over the pro, because the, you know, the prisoners kind of basically run every program in there. I had to pay the prisoners $100 to allow me to, uh, to take these programs in there. But to me, it was like, wow, I mean, I'll, I'll pay 200. I, I wanna take this, I need this trade. Cause I was thinking if I ever get out, what am I gonna do? I have never really worked other than cleaning houses and buildings uh, with my parents as a kid. But and when you're incarcerated, you see this common theme uh, where people keep coming back, right? And they're saying, it's hard out there, man. It's hard, Jason, you don't understand. And I was sick and I was drinking, I had to take NyQuil and they test me and for some reason they violated me. That's all I did. And you think they're lying, right? And you're like, man, come on, it can't be that hard out there. Just let me get a shot. I'll show you, I'll show you how it's done, right? Just let me get out there one, one day. So I get my day, right? I get my big day. 17 and a half years later, I get my big day. And you know what, what, it, what, what a prisoner say? I'm gonna hit the ground running, right? Ain't nothing gonna stop me, right? Nothing gonna stop me. So when I'm out there, uh, I fill out an application, which they, you have to do them all online now, basically, which I didn't know how to operate a, uh, a computer, first of all. And I was just thinking, you know what, all I have to do, uh, if I could just meet, if, the, if I can meet the boss, if I can meet the manager, but you don't meet the boss or manager no more, right? Again, it's all through computer. And first, your name, your race, and your, uh, if you've been convicted of a felony. And then I didn't have a no, no type of, of uh, I had a criminal history, but I didn't have any work history. I was never getting any calls back. I was never getting no type of responses. And I was in a halfway house. And when you're at a halfway house, they tell you, you have 21 days to start paying on your fine and you have 21 days to get a job. If not, we're gonna send you back to prison. That is, re and I had exceeded that 21. So here I am so happy, because no, since, since I got this second life again, but then immediately, once I'm released, I'm told I'm gonna get, I'm, they're gonna send me back because I don't have a job, despite the fact that nobody would hire me, because I couldn't pay my fine, and that was despite the fact that I didn't have a, a job to pay for that fine. So, you know, you, you, I, I had this anxiety and, you know, just getting turned down over and over again. And I think that what you have to understand is that there's the stigma of that, you know, that, that scarlet letter that, you know, I call it the mark of the beast. But in the Bible, that mark of the beast, you have the privilege to, if you have that mark, you can buy, you can sell. But when you're a felon and you have that mark, you can't buy, you can't sell. That's the way uh, that I look at it. It's a scarlet letter, but I call it the, the, the mark of the beast because you just can't, you can't get rid of it. Some people look past the fact that I had a felony, right? They were like, everybody goes to jail nowadays. Everybody's using, selling drugs. And they were like, you don't have no work history, uh, Hernandez. Why not? You're 40 years old. I'm like, well, I was in prison. And they were like, prison? And they would step back, right? For 20 years? And I say, close and their eyes would get about this big way. And they would step on the table and they'd say, I can't have you working here. Uh, if my employees, the customers find out that you've been in prison, they're not gonna wanna work here, they're not gonna wanna be here. So it's, it's one thing about the felony that you have to overcome, but there's, people didn't, it was so weird because people didn't care too much. They didn't say, we're not gonna hire you because you were selling drugs and you were committing crimes and you were poisoning your community. They didn't wanna hire me because I was in prison. That was my crime to them. My punishment was my crime to them. And when I thought that that was over, I thought that everything would be over and it wasn't. And I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be, again, I didn't want to complain because I knew that there were millions of people who would just love to be in that situation that I was in. So being denied over and over and over and over, uh, but not having no money and not wanting to uh, rely on my parents when I would be on the train, there was this place, it was called PSL Plasma. And trying to catch the train, I would hear the, the homeless people and they would I hear them talking about how they would get money. You could go sell your plasma twice a week, depending on how much you could give. Uh, you could get anywhere between 20 to $50. So one day I'll walk in there and because I need money. And sure enough, when I go to the screen, I look up and it says people that are prohibited from giving blood. Uh, one of them is Somebody who, if you have been formerly incar if you have been incarcerated over 72 hours, you have to wait a year 
to give blood. And to read that, right, to, to read that my blood, what gives me life, uh, is not good enough to save another person's life. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it breaks you, especially when, every, when everybody's turning their back on you, right? Um, you know, that my blood is not good enough for anybody else. But I didn't want to give up, right? I didn't want to give up. And I, I, I knew how to weld. And I said, what, what can I do? I got to do something different. And what I did, I actually took that paper that the president gave me, telling me that he commuted my sentence. And I went to this job that, uh, that hired welders. And I, when it said, check the box and explain, I checked that box and I said, well, tell you in person, I didn't want to put what, I, what, what happened, because they usually, you don't get an interview after that. So the lady came and she was Hispanic. And she goes, what are you talking about right here? What do you mean explain? And then I showed her the order of <coughs> President Barack Obama. She read it and she's, uh, you know, she started crying, right? She called everybody in. She's like, read this and everybody, it was like, it was nothing but Hispanics. And unfortunately, his, a lot of Hispanics are in prison, right? So the lady said, you know what, Jason? My brother was in prison. Nobody wanted to give him a chance, but somebody did. Now he's married, he has a job, he has kids, he's doing wonderful things now. I'm gonna tell my manager to give you a chance. All I need is your driver's license. <laughs> right? Right? You should have been in Jersey. You'd have had it before you went <laughs> <Right>. in. <laughs> and I t so I was immediately hired and immediately fired because one, I didn't have a license. Two, I didn't know how to drive a car, right? <laughs> And in Dallas, it, 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 takes you about a, it takes you about a month to get to take the test, and it takes you about another month to take uh, the written test and the actual driving test, so I couldn't get the job. But then I found out about another place that uh, they told me that, you can know what, this, there's this other welding company, you can go work for them. So I go over there, they start me, they lowball me. A welder in, in Texas starts off around sixteen fifty an hour. He started me off at $10 an hour saying, just prove yourself and we'll go up on your pay over a week. Stay there a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, never went up on my pay. And what I found out was that this guy had a scheme to where he would do nothing but hire formerly incarcerated people and people that were here undocumented. Mm. And with that, he would lowball them on their pay and the safety conditions there were, uh, you know, just people were getting burnt, cut, uh, all kind of things. So this is what this is what they were. Uh, I mean, this whole business. He pulled up in Ferrari. He pulled up in a Ferrari. Had the big American flag posted right there on his in his building. But uh, and then then ultimately I, I got a break. I started working at a uh, a place that hired nothing but formerly incarcerated kids to teach them how to cook. Uh, to, uh, it's called Cafe Momentum. It's a year uh, apprenticeship program. They hired me there, but they were going to hire me as a mentor. But they to be a mentor and to teach the kids how to cook, but they couldn't because they got money from Dallas County. And because they got money from Dallas County, I was a felon and I couldn't, they had to hire, I had that hired me as a dishwasher, which was great. I mean, I was, I was just happy to be out and happy to share my experience with those kids. So they didn't have to go through what I went through. But, you know, again, I, I take that under consideration when you're, when you're advocating for people about not only the felony, but that, that, in, that they've been in prison, right? And I call it, what I call it is the, the pit bull syndrome, right, to where dog lovers, they're advocates against don't fight pit bulls, we're against that, then we're loving dogs, but then yet I think there's 25% of the dog loving world want pit bulls banned, right? Mm -hmm. Well, oh, don't fight them, but we don't want them around us, mm -hmm. we don't want them around our kids, and I get that, it's, it's, and it's something that I, that I, that I deal with uh, emotionally because here, in this environment, I'm seen as somebody as a social justice warrior, a second chance. But I can go to another room, and I'm scum of the earth, right? Uh, should be back in prison. You know, but th that's what it is. And, and I, uh, you know, it, it doesn't get me down. It just empowers me and makes me fight. And to prove them wrong uh, at, the, at the end of the day. But I think that we have to focus on, I've had a lot of doors open for me because I have that piece of paper. It's one thing to say you have life without parole and you've been in prison 20 years and you've gotten out. But when you can say, President Barack Obama let me out, it knocks a lot of windows down. So how do we create that paper, right? Mm -hmm. To show everybody, hey, you know what, he's been in prison, but this is, he, he is somebody you can believe in for this reason. So how, what, what is that paper, what does it look like? 
Thank you for that. I want to follow up on that. Sure, because sure. I want to talk about what that paper looks like, because <laughs> uh, it's a great segue. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, if I may. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, in the past five or six years, particularly, states um, have begun to realize that there's an untapped resource and a lot of waste um, in not taking advantage of the enormous energy and talents and additional loyalty and doggedness of people who have had an adverse encounter with the justice system and who very frequently end up you know, as, as tremendously valuable and talented employees. So how do we get past that? How do we create a ticket uh, to get rid of the scarlet letter to, to uh, so that we don't call people by labels anymore and that they're individuals, that they're people with a criminal record. Uh, and, and I can't tell you that, how, that there's any one particular approach. The, the degree of creativeness that's going on in the states right now um, is just amazing. Um, I come out of a tradition where a pardon was the way to get rid of the scarlet letter. But increasingly, um, there are other types of relief, judicial relief, whether it's record sealing or expungement or judicial certificates of good conduct or rehabilitation. Um, there's a whole recent series of wonderful laws that have been modeled on uh, a proposal from the um, Institute for Justice that um, regulates licensing boards. 25% um, of the jobs in this country uh, require some sort of government license. And the extent to which you can, you, you can preclude uh, licensing boards from imposing vague good moral character um, qualifications to exclude people with a criminal record, that's tremendously important. And, and I, I am really encouraged by that law reform effort. Um, so there are a lot of different, I don't think that any state uh, has necessarily hit upon the ideal combination of relief, although I do have one pet state, which is perhaps surprisingly to some of you, Indiana, uh, which, um, which I think has done enormously progressive things. And interestingly enough, most of the most progressive legislation is not coming from the states that you would think it would be coming from. They are, it's coming from the Midwest, red states, um, and this feeds into this idea of coalition building that was talked about in the panel a little bit earlier this afternoon. Um, there are many, many people of different political stripes, of different uh, professional training and experience that are all kind of converging to deal with this scarlet letter problem. Um, and because uh, of the wasted human resources, because of moral concerns that it is simply not right to burden people with, with, these, uh, with this discrimination um, for the rest of their lives. So, um, so I, frankly, I'm kind of optimistic about what's going on now. I mean, it's going to be a long time. I really hope that it's not um, four generations. Um, and I don't think it is four generations. I think we're coming rapidly toward a time when there will be a way, uh, and the criminal defense lawyers will have a role in it um, through, through advocacy for their clients, keeping them out of the system at the front end, um, and that there will be a new breed, as is perhaps daydreaming, uh, but that there will be a new breed of prosecutors um, who will be agreeable and courts to crafting, and don't laugh, Jason. Uh, perhaps I am halluc <laughs> hallucinating. I don't think so. I mean, there, there are people like Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, um, uh, and, and I, I, I just know that there are others. In fact, I can't recite their names right now. But, but, but and, and to, to, to vote, to get out the vote, to vote for the DAs that are more, ah, the DA of Marion County, Indianapolis, uh, he's very progressive. They've done more than 12,000 expungements, and they do them themselves, the DA's office. Um, so anyway, so I am 
frankly, a little bit optimistic. I have to be optimistic, or it would be too depressing to to uh, continue to do this work with with uh, all the disabilities that that uh, uh, burden people who have a criminal record. So, but anyway, I I urge you all to take a look the 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 Restoration of Rights Project, uh, which is uh, a, a creation and and um, created and maintained by a partnership of organizations, including NACDL, um, that keeps track of all of the legislation that's being developed. Um, and to the extent that, that um, uh, we can uh, uh, learn from what's going on in, in other jurisdictions and bring advocates from those other jurisdictions or advocates that have been active there to help us with our own reform efforts. Uh, I think that's gonna be a very important thing going forward. Thank you for that. We're gonna uh, take some questions in a minute, but John, you yeah. know, no, I just wanted to alert them that we're yeah. gonna be taking questions and we're probably gonna wrap up early so you can leave a little bit early. But I mean, John, here you are, right on crime, in this room with these folks, and, and Margie has just talked about coalition building and mm -hmm. what's needed there. I, I suspect that's what you want to speak to at this sure, point. Sure, a couple things. Um, you know, it, the red states are doing really well uh, compared to what even I would expect. Again, I'm a person from New Jersey, uh, you know, did a lot of work for the NAACP, I had the chance to meet President Obama uh, in Newark, um, and uh, he didn't invite me into his house. He had to come to mine, I guess. <laughs> but uh, but in any event, um, you know, it was interesting because then I, I remember when uh, I was talking, was joining this project, and I'm like, you all Googled me, right? You know, you know you're talking about? <laughs> like, I think I've been, I've been in prison. Uh, and and, and uh, some of the other factors. But you know what? It is red states. And I can tell you I was in Mississippi. Anybody from Mississippi here? That's a real surprise. Um, so uh, in any event... Um, I get sent to Mississippi because there was a bill that was stalled, uh, HB 387, and it had a lot to do with creating debtors' prisons around these unpaid fines and fees. But a really interesting piece when you talk about collateral consequences was parole and probation violations due to the lack of transportation in Mississippi. So uh, so what we were able to do was to, they, they sent me to, to go see the governor and uh we ended up uh, having having this bill. This bill was signed into law, and the key part that I really liked about it, besides the debtors' prisons issue, is that it allows parole officers to do their parole meetings by FaceTime and Skype. So that way, a person doesn't have to walk off the job site, right, to to go make their way across the state to a parole office. So that's actually stopping a collateral consequence before it happens, right, or a technical violation before it happens. You know, with respect to clemency, it, it's funny. So I. I find myself, I'm very blessed to, to be part of the conversation like so many of us in this room. And I go to the White House probably every two to three weeks to, to talk to the folks over there. And to this, to, I still need an escort required badge, which is kind of funny to me, right? So uh, and as usual, I tried to make a joke which fell flat. Um, so I, I, <laughs> they keep putting an escort required on me, and, but they keep inviting me back, right? So like at some point, like, Obviously, I've been here enough. I didn't cause any ruckus. You know, maybe I can just walk in like a normal person. So I, I try to talk to the Secret Service about it. It's, it. it's their policy, which makes sense, I guess. So I said, well, you know, I'm not driving anywhere on the campus here, and I don't drink anymore. So, like, the prospect of me committing a crime is pretty low. And, of course, they just stared at me like this and said, here's your ID back. Your escort is coming. Um, so when you think about it, right, the I'm encouraged, though, by the fact that I'm even at that table, number one. I'm encouraged by the fact that the president is talking about clemency in his first term. And I don't see that. I mean, I look at New Jersey and, uh, you know, a, a very dear friend and criminal justice leader who's in the room had the chance to get pardoned by Governor Christie. Uh, but it was in the second term, right? Unless you had a gun offense that the governor didn't agree with, you weren't getting pardoned in New Jersey until your second term. And I think that's par for the course everywhere. You look at Obama's pardons as well. I didn't see him even ta having the conversation first term. So I am encouraged. Um, and, and, and the beauty is that the, the groundwork that, that so many at NACDL have laid on clemency, you know, hopefully will come to bear soon. Um, because 
I, I do think that we're starting to see a, a change because when the red states get involved, you start to get, it starts to become okay, right? So no one ever is going to accuse Texas of being soft on crime. So if Texas wants to do diversion, other red states will follow, except Florida, of course, but, you know, because it's Florida. <laughs> but, right, other than Florida, other places will follow. Um, and I think that that's what we're seeing. I remember being a little nervous when I got sent to Mississippi, and I'm like, because you know, I'd never been there, and I'm like, well, they're probably not going to let me out, but on the upside, <laughs> I, I look more like the guy putting cuffs on people than wearing them, so that'll help for a little while um, until they learn who I am. But I was tremendously inspired by the work Mississippi has done with Pew and in Mississippi's trying to do and fix these issues. And, uh, but they have cover. They have political cover. And Governor Bryan will say it. He's like, look, I was a narcotics officer. No one's ever going to accuse me of being soft on crime. So I can do these things. And I think that that is where, when we start changing the narrative, we have to change the narrative of governors and legislators who are smart on crime. We have to be very, we have to be, we have to really come together to give them cover. When they do something that's smart on crime that makes sense for the reentry population, excuse me, or the sentenced population, we need to make sure that any coalition that calls them soft on crime is then at least met with a response. Because if they're met with crickets and there's only one voice, nothing's going to change. Oh, thank you for that, Nikiji. And, wow. and certainly, that's, you know, I'm sorry you had that experience. And, and there's no good reason for that, right? I mean, is it to keep her, your mother from recidivating in the grave? You know, I don't mean to make a joke of it, but that's how ridiculous it is. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's stories like this that highlight the need for us to talk with clients, especially those who've come through the system before, about the things that impact them so that we can include this in the advocacy around them. You know, to say, my client won't be able to be buried with their loved one, right, is huge. Thank you, Koichi, for that. And thank you, Nikichi, for that. Hi, um, I have a question about. Tell us uh, your name. Oh, sorry. Hi, Ngozi and the WACP. I just like microphones. Um, <laughs> I have a question um, about certificates of restoration and so. So, um, uh, for Margie, but also for the whole panel. So, thinking about this, so I know um, uh, how they're operating in some states and that there's a lot of, of work and effort that people put into getting one, but they don't have that kind of power that that letter that uh, from President Obama has for you, that there, there's a lot of effort that people take in, in getting records sealed, but depending upon you know where you're at or expunged, there, it's so narrow that you do a lot of work and, and you still end up in a place where you're still facing the same barriers. So could we talk a little bit about when we're, we're dealing with you know, uh, life after uh, criminal conviction, where, how do we see big picture to actually um, make the changes that are transformative in the way that, that society's looking at people in, in criminal justice system? Because I think about the amount of energy that, that was taken in some places to kind of get these things, certificates and sealing and things like that, and then you see the return on investment and you're just like, you know, I feel like I'm give, doing people a disservice by sending them that route. Mm -hmm. Margie, you want? Well, I think that's a really good point. Um, the challenge is, I think, to develop um, some sort of relief mechanism, restoration mechanism, um, that is effective, accessible. Um, the piece of paper that Jason got, which was a commutation order, um, a, full pardon would be an even more effective. Why would a presidential pardon be so effective if a judicial certificate that had exactly the same legal effect, that's a caveat, it may not, but, but, but if one could be created that had the same legal effect and the same effect of sort of declaring someone to be fully rehabilitated and, and of good conduct, why would that not be the same? Maybe it's a problem of being able to sell it to the public. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one problem. And to the extent that there is discrimination, and, and you're not really dealing with a kind of a mandatory consequence that may be lifted by one of these orders, but rather a kind of a su subtle discretionary discrimination, uh, that is a problem of education. It's also a problem of enacting laws that prohibit it and that can be enforced. I mean, EEOC has had its guidance and they've had some um, pretty successful suits. Um, I'm also a big fan of these licensing laws that, that are really clamping down on the ability and putting totally the burden on licensing agencies to justify denying someone in writing uh, based on their criminal record, if they can do the job. So I, I think there are lots of experiments that we need to do. You're absolutely right that, that a lot of the relief, particularly, for example, if a certificate is given by prison authorities, it's really not worth very much, frankly. Um, if it's given by uh, a judge, it's worth a lot more. Uh, and I'm putting aside the legal effect, it's worth a lot more from a sort of a psychological point of view. Um, but I totally agree that the challenge is to find effective relief. The problem with the record sealing and expungement relief is that it doesn't reach very high in most states. Pennsylvania, that has just gone to huge lengths mm -hmm. to enact this automatic sealing, mm -hmm. it's effective only for non-conviction records and uh, misdemeanors of second and third degree. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't reach felonies. So now there are some states that have extended record sealing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's, it's where I grew up in collateral consequences that I'm not as big a fan of record sealing as I am for a more transparent kind of uh, authoritative relief mechanism. Although I'm coming to believe that at least for lower level offenses, expungement and sealing is appropriate. Um, that's why I kind of like the Indiana model that is tiered. Um, again, I'm, I'm Mike Pence signed that law into, into <laughs> so who knew, you know? <laughs> Jason or John, do you want to weigh in and yeah, then we'll do yeah, one more sorry. question? No, no, no there's, nothing I can, there's nothing I can add that would okay. be better than that, uh, except to plug my own state that our expungement laws are, are complete forgiveness. Uh, when, if you can get it expunged, you can say you were never arrested on a, on a future application. So that's one place where New Jersey leads. Fine? A liar. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem with the record sealing. Well, it's so. the same with a pardon, right? If, if I get right. pardoned tomorrow and they Google me and they find it, or right. they find my record, then I'm still a liar, right? No. Par no. Par pardon leads to expungement no, in New no. Jersey and other states. It certainly not in does. Fed not in the federal system. Well, because there is no expungement in the federal system. No, 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 but a pardon, mm -hmm. if we're talking about a pardon, it does not lead to expungement mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the federal system. And in most states, not all states, in some states it does, but in some states it does not. So, so you wouldn't be lying. Uh, you'd say, yes, I was convicted, but I was, but I was pardoned by President Obama or whoever, Trump, I guess. Jason, you want to add anything? Yeah, and, and if I just uh, could add real quick, I, I think if you look at our Constitution, uh, it makes no mention of any type of uh, direct appeal. It doesn't mention 2255, 2241. What it does mention, though, is the president and every governor in the United States authority on federal discretion basically to grant pardons, to grant commutations. But it's something that's never used. It's rarely used. It's like this taboo word, right? Even when, uh, when President Barack Obama, I was one of the first eight individuals to receive clemency from President Barack Obama. It was in his fifth year, right? But again, when we were trying to find people that were doing clemency, wasn't, wasn't nobody doing it. That lady right there was, Nikita Taif, I, I tell you, she was way ahead of the curve. Her and another individual that had a, a family member that was incarcerated, I had to learn by my own, right? There was no manuals. There was no forms for me to look at. I had to teach myself how to do a clemency petition. And if I would have waited for some organizations to come to accept me, I'd still be in there right now because they told me I would, never have, I would have never received it, right? Now, I'm out, a formerly incarcerated, right? I ain't never been to law school. There's law schools that call me to go talk. And you know what they asked me to teach them about? They asked me to teach them about clemency, right? Me, not attorneys. Because from my understanding, clemency is not taught in law school, right? I advocate for clemency. 
since I've been out, I helped six other individuals receive clemency that were serving life without parole, cases that people that thought they would never get it. I'm, I'm doing clemency on the state level. I have asked support, people to support me, right? Funding, you need money for this. I've never received a dollar for, for the work that I do for clemency, right? Why, do, why won't they support it? It doesn't affect a lot of people, Jason. It's not sustainable. You can't expand it. Well, how do you know if you don't ever try, right? Luckily, so what, and another thing, right? Because I am still on parole, right? I'm on, they don't, feds don't have parole, but they do. Believe me, they could put me back in prison if they want to right now. My judge found out that I was doing petitions for people. You know what she did? She put an order against me saying that you cannot help prisoners, no, you cannot file clemency petitions for prisoners no more. So what did I do? I had to, I had to figure out a different way. I work, through, I work through the families now. I work through law clinics. Uh, luckily, the Soros just, I, I became a Soros Justice Fellow this year. They invested in me. Thank you so much. They invested in me to create a clemency curriculum for colleges. They, they invested in me to create a clemency toolkit, right? So that when those prisoners in there, when they tell them that uh, your life's not worth investing, right? Or when they tell the families, well, we can't do clemency because there's no funds for it, that they could do it themselves, right? Lead their own campaign because whoever, regardless of ever who's, who's in office, whether it's the president or the governor, that, that life matters, right? And when, when the doors close and when the organization shut down, the families are gonna be the only ones there and the prisoners are gonna be the, be the only ones there. And just when, when, when Cynthia, when, when, when Clemency Project 2014 started, they taught, you had, you had to teach people how to do clemency, they had to teach attorneys how to do clemency. That's insane. Why are they not being taught this in school? Why when a person is, why, why when, when I was sentenced to life without parole, why did my lawyer not tell the judge, can you at least make a statement to say, Jason is, should be considered for clemency one of these days, right? I, and I would, I would ask that the attorneys in here, the people that you're defending to do that from now on, that that be part of, part of the sentencing procedure. If you, feel that that, if you feel that your defendant has been too severely punished, which more than likely if he's African American or Hispanic, he, probably, he or she probably is, that if that individual shows while they're incarcerated, that they have reformed, that they would be more than willing to do a, a, a support letter and, and support of their, uh, their pardon or their, their commutation of sentence. Uh, you know, Jason, let, let me just say, every once, <laughs> while, every once in a while, I would get a letter from a judge when I was pardon attorney, and I've had a couple of clients who actually have had judges say at sentencing that they would recommend it. So, so it's, not, it, it's not a completely, is this on or off? No, it's off. I think um, so they'll turn it on for you. Oh, oh, oh. Can we so just catch? this is a really good idea. I mean, it's a really good idea, and that's that's something that that defense lawyers ought to know about. But I'm just saying it's not completely unprecedented. There are judges that do that. So to encourage more judges to do that would be a really good thing. So it's an excellent. And if and I oh, and if I could just add real quick, my my clinic, what what I see is just how they have expungement clinics, right? I see clemency clinics, right? Not only for people that are incarcerated, but for those that got that mark of the beast right there, right? You got 70, 80 million people out there with, with convictions, whether they're uh, 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 misdemeanors or felonies, that they're still out there, right? Something that I, I, I will die a felon, unfortunately, right? Unless this president or the, or the next president gives me, uh, uh, pardons me. But if that don't happen, I will die a felon, regardless of what I do in my life. And that shouldn't be the case. I paid for my crime. I shouldn't have to pay for it until the, until the day that I die. Just like Nikichi uh, mentioned right now, even when even in the afterlife, right? Shouldn't be like that. So ho my plan is again to see mass clemency, and we got we got to talk about it, right? We got we got we got we got we got to uh, even if we don't think that this governor or this president wouldn't won't allow it, we still got to put it on the table, because when that time comes, we know who these prisoners are who need this relief. Right. We have mechanisms set in that we're not running around scrambling. Oh, we only have six months this, till this governor leaves. Oh, we only have three months until President Barack Obama leaves. It should that that everybody's mad at President Barack. A lot of people are mad at President Barack Obama because he could have done more. But I don't put that on him or his administration. I put that on uh, on attorneys. I put that on uh, criminal justice reform organizations who are not thinking about it. Right. There's a lot of people that were left in there. A lot of good people. And it wasn't Barack Obama's fault, I could tell you that right. from my point of view.
we're going to have one one more question, but it strikes me that this this ask of judges for this um, you know request for clemency can also be supported by sort of this notion. It's like when I file a motion for fair trial, right? Is the judge going to deny that, right? So uh, when you talk to the judge about if you are now committing them to the care of the Department of Corrections, what you are saying, judge, is that you believe in the ability of the Department of Corrections to rehabilitate this person. Otherwise, you shouldn't be committing them to that place. And if you believe in that, then you know that there is an opportunity for them to come out after having been rehabilitated by the place to which you are sending them now. So you might want to think about that when you think about making these arguments, too. Hello, my name is Callie Greer. I'm here with my husband, Alfonso Greer. We're from I'm in Alabama. Uh, we are formerly incarcerated between us. We've served 25 plus years. We've been out over 20 years. Um, um, and so can I give a two-part question? Yeah, if it's quick. <laughs> I, I, it's quick. Okay. Well, well, maybe not quick. Okay. <laughs> we'll give but it anyway. It's two parts, and I, I, I can't miss the opportunity for either one. Sure. I, I might not, okay, so my husband and I both have a partner. And um, for the last five years, he's not been able to, to get a job because every time he applies, that shows up. His record shows up. So a pardon is really not a big good deal for us in Alabama. The second one is the most important one. I have a brother that um, was incarcerated when he was 19 years old, and um, he turned 60 years old mm. um, in April. He's been locked up 40 years. Here in I mean in the state of Alabama, and so I just want to ask um, Mr. Hernandez, would he help us with the clemency project? I I can tell you I'll tell you right now I am helping the University of Alabama right now do a clemency petition for a lady named Geneva Cooley who is 73 years old and is, has life without parole has been in there since yes, 2003 right. for 83 grams of heroin. I am doing a clemency petition for a person in California, another person that nobody would help out who has like who has. 37 to life, who I believe is actually innocent. I'm about to start a project right now with the lifers in Angola through Texas A&M Law Clinic. Okay. So I would, whoever wants to talk about clemency, come on, I'm, I'm here. You. I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> and, and let me just add, before we wrap up, I'm sorry about your experience. I want to acknowledge the humanity in that, right? I'm sorry about your experience with your brother and with you as well. And they didn't do it in my name, I'll tell you that. They didn't do it in my name. Because if it had been in my name, it would have been done differently. I think that's important that we acknowledge that human beings are affected by this racist, uh, classist system uh, that we fight against every day. I hope that you have felt empowered by this amazing panel. I hope you will take the wonderful research that NACTL has done in the collateral consequences uh, research that it's done uh, and use it to advocate on behalf of your clients. Listen to them and hear the things that affect them both, you know, sort of on the structural level, but in the heart as well, uh, in the heart as well, and tell their stories. Make sure the judges know that what they're doing is giving them a scarlet letter F. Thank you for being here today. Thank you.